So in our 1997 study, we had 17 different ecosystem services, and we uh, did a meta-analysis. We surveyed the literature and, uh, and got estimates of the contribution to well-being of each of those in, in dollar terms, added them all up. Um, <clears throat> we recognized that there were you know, um, limited studies, of, particularly of some, some biomes. And so uh, since then, there been a lot more, there's been a lot more research done, so we've updated the, the unit values, the per hectare, uh, per year uh, values. Uh, almost all of those have increased because there have been uh, substantial new, new studies. Uh, but we also then looked at the change in land, air, land use uh, over, over that time period, and there have been substantial losses of very high-value ecosystems like coral reefs and, and uh, coastal wetlands and, and uh, tropical forests. And those, uh, so the, the, um, uh, the, the, the value uh, estimates have gone up, but the land areas uh, of the high value ones have gone down and the net effect has been uh, a total, a loss of, of uh, aggregate value in the order of $20 trillion per year. Mm -hmm. So it's a substantial loss of, you know, of uh, a value contribution uh, compared to, you know, which, some, which has to be balanced against the, the gains in, in, uh, in GDP. And I think those two things are, are uh, canceling each other out. We could do much better, you know, if we take these into, into account. We could create, you know, forms of agriculture that don't, don't destroy the ecosystem services and at the same time produce the, the uh, agricultural products that, that we need. Uh, likewise, for other, other sectors of the economy, we could, you know, once, once you're aware of these trade-offs, I think we can do a much better job of, of creating, you know, win-win situations. First, we have to recognize that um, human well-being and the sustainability of that well-being depends on a lot more than simply how much we produce and consume, the things that are measured in, in, in things like GDP. So, so I, I think once you've realized that and begin to try to measure uh, how much uh, these other assets, uh, in addition to our, our built capital, our economy, how much do these other assets actually contribute to human well-being? So, uh, we're trying to estimate the, uh, the value, the, the contribution to well-being of uh, our, our natural capital um, and uh, the ecosystem services that it, it provides. Um, so we did a study back in 1997 that estimated that value at being su substantially larger than GDP. And we're recently, now we're working on an update uh, to that study based on, on new da data uh, that shows that, that in fact it's substantially larger. but but there have been losses since 1997 of our, of our natural capital assets, the change in land, uh, land use, we've lost wetlands, we've lost tropical forests, we've lost coral reefs, and so there's been a substantial decline in the, in the total contribution to human well-being from that natural capital. And we have to start bringing these ideas on board uh, and build them into our, our accounting and our policy frameworks if we really want to build a sustainable future that maintains human quality of life uh, going forward, and that's really what what this the, the primary goal should be. Uh, so, for another example, is uh, we've been working with a uh, an alternative measure to GDP. GDP does not measure human well-being; it measures production and consumption of of marketed uh, goods and services, things we pay for. It's one contribution to human well-being, but it's certainly not not the only one. Uh, so, if you start uh, estimating some of the negative effects, uh, the loss. Of air and uh, you know air and water pollution, the costs of those things, uh, the, the loss of social capital in various ways, um, the uh, uh, maldistribution of income. So worsening income distribution has an impact on welfare versus income. If you take all those things into account, there's a measure called the Genuine Progress Indicator uh, that does that. And we recently synthesized all of the studies at, in uh, various countries, 17 different countries that have done that. And uh, it showed that at the global level, even though GDP continues to increase, GPI uh, leveled off in about 1978 or so, and it's been fairly flat since then. So continuing to emphasize growth in GDP as a solution to all of our problems is really a, a misplaced uh, policy because it ignores uh, these substantial now uh, external costs, things that are outside the market, that really do affect uh, human well-being. Uh, there was a recent study by TrueCost for, for TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, that estimated the, uh, the costs, the external costs associated with uh, business activities. Uh, and uh, their estimate was around uh, 7 
uh, trillion dollars per year of external costs that are not incorporated in in business accounting books or in or in GDP, and uh, so it it, it uh, recognized that many companies are are really not making a, a social profit; they're they're uh, they're making a private profit, but they're doing that by mislabeling some of these external costs as profit rather than, than as uh, as real costs. So I think we really need to change our whole accounting framework uh, to be much broader, much more comprehensive, uh, something that picks up you know, uh, many of these other external costs and, and benefits of, of things outside the market. And I think once we do that, we can plot a much more, uh, a much better course toward a sustainable and desirable future. Uh, the state of Maryland in the United States has recently adopted this genuine progress indicator, the GPI, as, as one of their primary uh, statistics. And they're beginning to develop policies now that that enhance the, the GPI and not the, and not the GDP of the state. Uh, so it's certainly possible for, for government organizations at, at any level uh, to, um, uh, you know, to incorporate these ideas and begin to use different measures. There's a lot of interest now from various quarters about alternatives to GDP. The um, Sarkozy, President Sarkozy in France uh, established a commission recently uh, with uh, Joe Stiglitz and Amartya Sen as chairs and they uh, they acknowledged, you know, the, uh, that GDP is, is a mis mismeasure of our, of our well-being, and there, uh, there are many alternatives that people are working on. GPI is just one of them. None of them are, you know, are uh, the perfect indicator of well-being, but I think as we begin to start looking beyond uh, what, what is uh, included in GDP, uh, we can make better, much better decisions, and certainly governments uh, can, can and should uh, take those things on board. Well, a long time is relative. So, you know, it's, it, GDP has only really been, you know, since, since World War II, part of the economic uh, and, and political planning process. And so, and even the creators of GDP, Simon Kuznets was, was uh, you know, he, he cautioned against uh, using GDP as a national policy goal uh, because he recognized the, the limitations of what it was, what it was actually measuring. It's not, uh, it's certainly a useful uh, piece of information but it's, you know, it's not something that should be the overall goal of, of policy. And I think it, um, <clears throat> you know, people are, are recognizing that uh, in, in various different quarters. Even you know, Ben Bernanke, the head of the, the, uh, uh, the Fed in the US, uh, you know, he gave a commencement speech recently called The Economics of Happiness, uh, recognizing that we're really, our real goal should be to enhance human well-being and sustainability and happiness and, and that uh, you know, GDP doesn't pick up uh, all of those things. So there's, there's absolutely no reason why we, we shouldn't move to something better. You know, um, the defenders of GDP often say, well, we can't measure these other things uh, as precisely as we can measure uh, GDP, but that's not really a good excuse. You know, we would, it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. We've seen over the, the last several years the, the outcome of that where income distribution gets worse. You know, if you focus only on production and consumption, it doesn't matter how it's distributed. Uh, you know, people's life satisfaction, the surveys, there have been many surveys of life satisfaction around the world and they show uh, no substantial increase even though GDP is going up. Um, we also need to distribute wealth, I think, more equitably uh, among countries. You know, so there are certainly some countries that need to increase their, their GDP. Um, but probably not in the same way that we have in the, in, in the past. We need to do it in a more equitable way that, that preserves their, their, uh, their other assets uh, that are not included in the market. So, so I think we have to get past the whole development model you know, of just grow GDP and everything else will solve itself. It's just clear that that, that doesn't happen, doesn't work, both in the developed and the developing countries. It's not a good, it's not a good strategy. And if we can create a more comprehensive view of what human well-being is all about, then I think that will help uh, all countries in their, in their development process. So in our 1997 study, we had 17 different ecosystem services, and we uh, did a meta-analysis. We surveyed the literature and, uh, and got estimates of the contribution to well-being of each of those in, in dollar terms, added them all up. Um, <clears throat> we recognized that there were you know, uh, limited studies, of, particularly of some, some biomes. And so uh, since then, there's been, a lot more, there's been a lot more research done. So we've updated the, the unit values, the per hectare uh, per year uh, values. Uh, almost all of those have increased because there have been uh, substantial new, new studies. 
Um, but we also then looked at the change in land, air, land use uh, over, over that time period. And there have been substantial losses of very high value ecosystems like coral reefs and, and uh, coastal wetlands and, and uh, tropical forests. And those, uh, so that the, um, uh, the, the, the value uh, estimates have gone up, but the land areas uh, of the high value ones have gone down and the net effect has been uh, a total, a loss of, of uh, aggregate value in the order of $20 trillion per year. Mm -hmm. So it's a substantial loss of, you know, of uh, a value contribution uh, compared to, you know, which, which has to be balanced against the, the gains in, in, uh, in GDP. And I think those two things are, are uh, canceling each other out. We could do much better, you know, if we take these into, into account. We could create, you know, forms of agriculture that don't, don't destroy the ecosystem services and at the same time produce the, the uh, agricultural products that, that we need. Uh, likewise, for other, other sectors of the economy, we could, you know, once, once you're aware of these trade-offs, I think we can do a much better job of of creating, you know, win-win situations.